And hello, everyone. Welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Kira Phillips in for Diane Macedo. And I'm Terry Moran. The FDA has now granted full approval of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine, making it the first COVID vaccine to transition from emergency authorization status to full FDA approval. This approval means that the Pfizer shot has shown enough effectiveness and safety data to meet the FDA's requirements. It is our top story today. The FDA officially grants full approval of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, the first vaccine to move from emergency authorization to full approval. So joining me to break this down is the CEO of Pfizer, Albert Berla. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kira. Well, let's begin with the fact that this is clearly a big step for science. But even in this big moment, Albert, there are still a lot of people in this country who are mistrustful of the vaccines for many different reasons. So why should people trust this approval? There are several people, but still they are not convinced and they have fears uh, that uh, and this is an emotional reaction have fears and you cannot just uh, explain it with uh, with data and science but some of them are were claiming that uh, because the vaccine didn't have a full approval that uh, was the main reason for their reluctance so finally uh, we have that and uh, that uh, should be a good reason for them now to go and get vaccines and as they are going to get their vaccines i'm sure the other people will also see them and uh, will get more comfortable a bit of a domino effect. So, especially as a parent, I want to know how soon will we see approval of the vaccine for kids under 12? We are working very intensively on that right now, and this is a very, very large study. So, uh, for kids between 5 and 11, I expect that our studies will be completed in September, by the end of the month. And then we will submit to the FDA, and then uh, it's up to FDA to do the review and approve it. That soon. So you're sticking to September. Yes, we are sticking to September and we know how important it is. You know, it's not only the U.S., but um, we, we are receiving calls from so many governments around the world that uh, they are urging us to accelerate the studies for kids because they know that uh, the school season is coming and that could become uh, quite a big issue with the kids being uh, unprotected. So we do everything we can to accelerate this uh, timeline. So now that this vaccine has been fully approved, doctors are able to prescribe it off-label, as you know. The head of the FDA has actually said they wouldn't recommend that for kids under 12 because the normal dosage may not be appropriate. So what are your thoughts on that, both for kids under 12 and for booster shots? I think that uh, it is not for me to speak about off-label use. Actually, there are very strict uh, rules that uh, they are not allowing pharmaceutical companies to discuss publicly off-label usage. Uh, what I can say, it is that uh, the product is approved for kids 12 and above, and that we will submit data by the end of September. We haven't submitted them yet about kids between 5 and 11. Okay. Well, as for booster shots, then, what do you think? Will this be three and done, or will this be a yearly shot, like what we do with the flu shot? We don't know. I don't think anyone knows, uh, certainly. But um, what I had said in the past as well, um, way back months, was that based on the totality of the data, I predicted that we will need a booster dose at around eight months. And then after that, likely will be an annual revaccination. For certain reasons that we can discuss, uh, This I came to this conclusion. I still believe this is a likely scenario. I don't think that, I don't say this is a certainty, but this is a likely scenario. All right, well, what about people who received the J&J &J vaccine? Should they be looking to Pfizer for a booster shot now? Is it safe to mix and match these shots? Again, this is not for me to speak about something like that. The regulators and CDC are the ones that should make recommendations. I know that there have been studies that, uh, that uh, really try to understand uh, this situation. They work, but this doesn't mean that uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, we have uh, either approval or recommendation to do so. Okay, because we are following what is happening overseas, so we'll continue to follow if the decision is made here it's in the States. It's happening in many countries. It is true that in many countries, the authorities over there, the CDC equivalent, they have recommended boosters on AstraZeneca or Gen Z. 
Got it. For, now, with uh, mRNA vaccines like us. What about the reports of myocarditis? How are you going to continue to monitor this side effect? Oh, we are monitoring because we have access to millions of data and uh, we are uh, having very intensive surveillance system, pharmacovigilance system, so that, uh, that brings to us all the data. Uh, as I said, so far, this is a very, very uh, rare uh, event that is happening a few in a million of people. So it's really uh, very rare. The Pfizer vaccine is more than 90 percent effective against infection from the original coronavirus. We've talked a lot about that. But recent studies found that the effectiveness starts to wane over time, possibly due to the Delta variant. So, Albert, do you agree with concerns that if a new variant comes along, that the Pfizer vaccine could become ineffective? And if so, how are you planning for future variants? Thank you, Kira. It's a very good question. And we have uh, established, particularly through our partnership, uh, research partnership with uh, uh, Israel, Israeli Minister of Health, a very good surveillance system. In Israel, they have used uh, our vaccine and they have 10 million people approximately and they have electronic medical records. So they have a very accurate uh, medical history for every uh, citizen of Israel. And we did see that uh, there was uh, a reduction in the infections, not that much in hospitalization at that time. And we try to understand, because we worry, is it because our vaccine is not effective against Delta, that was at the same time the dominant variant, or is it that after six months, the vaccine starts to wane, the efficacy of the vaccine? And after analyzing the data, we came to the conclusion that it is the second. Uh, the, the cases that were appearing in Israel were cases of six months old, and it was a very different situation in cases of three months old. So uh, we continued this, uh, uh, let's say, analysis of the data, and right now we feel very, very confident that um, a booster shot of uh, the same vaccine will be very, very effective, actually more effective than a booster, the second dose of the vaccine against the Delta variant. And uh, that we are monitoring not only with the study data that we have, but also we are doing real world, real world efficacy uh, study, uh, observations in Israel. I need to tell you that we are developing a Delta specific vaccine. We are developing a Delta specific vaccine because this is something very important. I cannot take a chance with global health and just based on my certainty, not have something ready in case we need it. I am almost certain that we will not need it. But as I said, I, I couldn't take the chance. If we don't need it, which is what I am predicting, we will put it on the shelves and we will continue with boosters of the same vaccine. If in any case I'm wrong, we will have a vaccine against Delta, which is specific. And if, in, if we do need the Delta specific vaccine, how soon would that become available? Very soon, because we are working, as I said, like if we need it. I know that we don't, but we are doing all the studies, all the manufacturing work, so we will be able to have it. Our policy is that every time that a variant appears, our scientists are getting their hands around it, and they characterize it as a variant of concern or not. Variant of concern means something that may escape the immune protection of our vaccine. For those, we are having a plan that within 100 days, actually 95 days, we will be able to have a new vaccine made. So this is where the, the, eff the efficiency that we have achieved right now. We started already the work done. So I think uh, we will have it uh, by the end of October, November, if it's needed. But I don't think it will be needed, I repeat again. Okay. From your mouth to God's ears. Pfizer CEO Albert Burla, appreciate your time today. Thank you, Kira. Thank you very much. And for more on Pfizer's full FDA vaccine approval, I'd like to bring in emergency medical physician and ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Darian Sutton, who's been with me here on set, also listening to this interview. First reaction. I thought that was really helpful. Uh, there were a lot of questions that were asked that me and other physicians have that I'm grateful that you asked here because we really want those answers. We wanna know what is the timeline, what is the data, and what are our next steps? And I feel really hopeful about this information. It's Terry. In a poll uh, from the Kaiser Family Foundation, 
in June, uh, they found that about a third, 31 percent of unvaccinated people say they would be more likely to get the vaccine if it received full approval from the FDA. 68 percent said uh, this wouldn't make them more likely to get a shot. And, and I've got a couple of questions. First, why should people trust this approval? What do you say to those uh, those who for whom this isn't good enough? And second, do you think this approval is enough uh, really to persuade more people in your practice? Did you hear that a lot? People like, well, I'm going to take a pause until we get full approval. You know, I've gotten both ends when I'm talking to patients in the emergency room and talking to people out in the community. There are specific groups of people who simply want that full approval. And like I said, this full approval helps to uh, solidify something that we're already seeing, which are that these vaccines are safe and effective. And if a full pr approval helps push that person from uh, uh, deliberation to actual decision making and getting a vaccine, I'm all for it. As for those reports of approximately 30 percent, I want to be optimistic and hope that it is as high as that. But I have to be realistic and say that in my personal experience, I have not seen that percentage of patients who are waiting for that full approval label. But again, any bit helps in this situation. Anything that concerns you? Anything you think he, he did you not get an answer you were looking for? You know, I come from the perspective of a science background, and so I understand that this takes time and effort. And for me, I just want to make sure that we continue to put out the data, which is that these vaccines are proving effective. And sometimes it can be confusing when we see these effective rates or effectiveness rates kind of change throughout time. But I want to reinforce that we expect to see that change, especially during an ongoing pandemic with more transmissible variants. And the goal that I hope people get today is that getting that vaccinated not only protects you, but protects the community, decreases the risk of us having new variants develop and gets us to our new normal sooner than later. And, and doctor, so how much do you think uh, of an impact this full approval will actually make in, in general, not just with this, but with, in general, the sense that people are learning about the process, how we go through it, how we go through it together, how scientists get, go through it. Do you think it'll make a difference in fighting vaccine hesitancy for this and others? Absolutely. And I always say, as the president had said earlier today, this is not just a pandemic against COVID-19. It's a pandemic against misinformation and the unvaccinated. And unfortunately, that misinformation has a tremendous amount of endurance. And as science communicators and physicians and healthcare providers, we try our best to get up every single day and preach about the information that we have gotten and the safety around this vaccine. So I'm really hopeful that people can take with this and feel more confident in their decision, especially those who have gotten vaccinated before and may feel a little bit remorseful or guilty or suspicious when they see this misinformation and have that buyer's, uh, that buyer's guilt that some people can have. And I speak to patients about it all the time. But for me, it helps me have some solid background where I can say this is the data. We have gotten tremendous amount of information. And honestly, there's been more data and study around this vaccine than there has about any treatment that we have available. And so I try to reinforce that it's effective and safe. You know, doctor, well, most of us have friends uh, or relatives who don't want to get the vaccine, and they got various reasons. What, what do you hear yeah. most uh, as a source of misinformation that, that really frustrates you? Well, Terry, I have to say I have family members who I'm still talking about getting the vaccine, and people would imagine that although I'm a physician and I'm sitting here communicating science, that it would be as simple as just telling my family members to get the shot. But I realize that those who have not gotten vaccinated, that group of people, they're not monolithic. Uh, they have many different reasons for why they chose to not get vaccinated. I have some patients that are truly concerned about their fear of needles, other patients that have real past and present trauma with the medical institution, and other patients who just simply deny that COVID-19 and this pandemic exists. And I have to say, I've met each and every one of them at, uh, in the emergency room as patients. And so I try my best to reinforce what we know, uh, give confidence about that, and also be honest about what we don't know and compare the risk when, terms, when we're looking at risk mitigation, or excuse me, when we're looking at risk uh, and understanding that when we're making a decision, sometimes you can get lost in the data. But really, what we have to understand is that COVID-19 poses a much greater risk than any of these possible rare adverse effects that we have seen with the vaccine. And these vaccines again are proving tremendously effective in keeping people out of the hospital. You know, it's interesting you're talking about your patients being hesitant. So they are going to, Pfizer is renaming the Pfizer vaccine uh, 
Cominarti. Uh, and, and all of us have been, what does that mean? How'd they put that together? And it's a combination of various COVID terms. But I asked you what you thought about that. And your answer was interesting that people just don't like to hear the word vaccine. We have to step away from, sometimes we have to step away from that trigger word. It, it, and you know, it provides a tremendous amount of bias. And when I talk to patients who come in who are unvaccinated, symptomatic, ill, and needing treatment, sometimes I'll ask them, you know, this medication, I'll reference, for example, Regeneron, is still under emergency use authorization and has limited data, but would you like it? And I have to say, every single time it is offered, it is taken. And that shows me that there's, it's really, really illuminating because it shows me that there is tremendous bias simply around the word vaccine and that people can understand their risk, but they just have to be centered in the problem. Well, that'll be interesting now with a different name and full FDA approval. It'll be interesting to follow the data now to I see what happens. I hope it makes a difference. Dr. Darian Sutton, thank you so much. Thank you. That is fascinating. Uh, that the word can make so much difference in these life and death decisions. But, but here in Washington, President Biden, he talked about the FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine earlier today, saying Americans who have been waiting for full approval should go get their shot now. The moment you've been waiting for is here. It's time for you to go get your vaccination and get it today, today. It's an important moment in our fight against the pandemic. You heard that note of urgency. The president says there's no time to waste because it's Delta variants causing a pandemic of the unvaccinated. ABC News political director, uh, deputy political director, Avery Harper joins us now for more. And, and Avery, the vaccination issues become so politicized as we've talked about. Do you think this uh, FDA approval could help take some of the politics out of this equation? For some, this will suffice, but there's still a sizable portion for whom uh, it will not be enough. If you look at the last ABC uh, Washington Post poll, about three in 10 Americans say uh, they weren't vaccinated and they probably or definitely uh, were not going to get one. So uh, it's still an uphill battle in terms of fighting the virus. Hmm. And so what do you think uh, we've heard from the president, a kind of gradual toughening of his tone, I think. He, he began uh, by encouraging people very gently, really, talking about solidarity, about do it for your neighbor and your loved ones and your colleagues, gradually now talking about mandates. Uh, what do you think this approval will mean for vaccine mandates? Right. For those who are not persuaded by the FDA authorization, in, in some cases, they're going to be compelled to uh, by max vaccine mandates. And we're uh, likely to see a flood of vaccine mandates now uh, that that FDA authorization is, is done. We've already seen it happen here in New York City, where I am. All education workers are going to have to be vaccinated without the option uh, of testing. Uh, the Department of Defense was holding off until uh, the FDA granted full authorization to the vaccine uh, in, in in order to require uh, service members to, to get vaccinated. So we're likely to see uh, the same across the country. And, and as the president pointed out, there are already vaccine mandates in place in so many ways for measles, for polio, for all kinds of things. Your kids have to get vaccine vaccinations before they go to school. Members of the military have to get vaccinated that too. So let's talk about a military operation. The other issue on the president's plate, big one, the Pentagon officials are now saying the U.S. has evacuated about 16,000 people from Afghanistan in the last 24 hours. And that's a serious clip and a serious improvement uh, from the early days here. President Biden says uh, the mission could keep U.S. troops in the country now, perhaps past the August 31st deadline, he said. But the Taliban, they've got a say in this. They warned that an extension would cross a red line. So what's at stake for this operation as it ramps up to get so many uh, Americans and American allies out of Afghanistan? What's, what's at stake for the operation and for President Biden politically, do you think? Well, what's at stake is really uh, the safety of the Americans that are still in Afghanistan and uh, the Afghan allies that are still there. Uh, we know that there are efforts to try and evacuate those folks to other countries, uh, but if it can't be done before the August 31st deadline uh, and the Taliban decides to escalate the situation, uh, we could be putting, uh, you know, American service members in harm's way. And a lot of what the White House has been touting over the past week is that there hasn't been any American loss of life, and, and no one wants that to change. Mm, absolutely. That would, uh, that would change the tenor of the coverage and of the discussion around the country, no question. Deputy Political Director Avery Harper, thanks as always. Well, the Pentagon has ordered six commercial airlines 
to help evacuate people from Afghanistan. Sounds a little bit like Dunkirk uh, in World War II. It's all part of the Defense Department's Civil Reserve Air Fleet Program, which compels commercial airlines to help the emergency airlift. Transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the latest on this. Hi, Gio. Hey there, Kira. Two flights just landed here at Dulles International Airport. This is all part of the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, and it's the first time it's been activated in nearly 20 years. Here's the breakdown right now. Commercial airlines are providing 18 planes, three each from American Airlines, Delta, Atlas Air, and Omni Air, two from Hawaiian Airlines, and four from United. In addition, Southwest saying overnight it will operate four charter flights today, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, the planes are not going to Afghanistan. They are picking up evacuees in other countries. One Atlas Air flight landed here overnight and then that United flight and Delta flight both came from Germany. They landed here this afternoon. Evacuees will include U.S. citizens and residents along with Afghans at risk, including those who helped America over those 20 years. Now, we don't know exactly how many passengers are on board, but most of the planes can fit about 300 passengers or more. This is only the third time the Department Department of Defense has activated this policy. Now, some of these Afghans have already been fully screened because they have these special immigrant visas in hand, but many do not. And those will go to a special facility like a military base for additional screening. Now, the Afghans who already do have those visas will be resettled across the country, Kira. All right, Gio, thanks so much. Uh, and you got a chance also to interview some of the refugees coming off those first flights. Let's take a listen to what they had to say about the situation in Afghanistan and their journey to the U.S. Uh, the people who work with the U.S. Army or U.S. Uh, government, they, uh, they should uh, leave Afghanistan because they are on uh, dangerous. This day, my 10 day I'm coming to here. Wow. Three day in the Doha, after the three day I'm coming to uh, Germany. In the Germany, the last night this bring it here. So you've been traveling for mm -hmm. about 10 days mm -hmm. just to get here? Yes. I feel, I feel, I feel great and thank US, United States for their solutions for people. Uh, they have a problem and uh, US make them way to come to feel better, feel safe. I feel well. Thank you. Mm. Gio Benitez there at Dulles Airport. Thanks. Coming up, at least 21 people have lost their lives in Tennessee as rescue teams are searching for dozens more who are still missing in the wake of those tremendous deadly floods. We'll have the latest on that situation when we return. We're going to go to our uh, coverage of the Tennessee flooding in just a minute, but we want to go over to the Pentagon right now, where a briefing is underway on the situation in Afghanistan. Let's listen to A potential threat to airlift operations. I would just say as we watch that, uh, you know, our, our, our crews are the best in the world. Uh, that, that machine, the C-17, is the best in the world. And, and, and I'm confident that we're taking the right measures to mitigate the threat and we're connected to the right sources and taking the right kind of measures. And I'll, I'll probably leave it at that uh, for, for reasons, for good reasons. And ground uh, operations, um, we were discussing earlier today at the briefing about just the one hour on the ground quick rotation. Can you talk about how the, you're managing that, how the planes and the crews are managing that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, you know, we've got uh, a, a number of planes in the system, but we have twice as many crews. And the idea is to keep those planes moving all, all the time, either by extending the crew day or preferably by swapping crews and keeping the iron in motion. And so there's a very, uh, you know, there's a very tight detailed management system to do that. Critical to that, of course, is what you mentioned, which is ground time. The faster we can turn either load or discharge, the faster we can turn that aircraft. And, and we're razor focused on, on bringing down. And I, I really appreciate the work on going in, in Afghanistan to bring down the time on ground to under an hour. Nancy. Thank you. Um, General, can you give us a sense how you foresee the mission um, changing as the U.S. draws down the number of ground forces in Afghanistan in the final days of the month and what the mission will look like if there is one post August 31st? 
Yeah, I mean, every day we take as the day comes. Um, we are we are razor focused on Neo. Uh, we know uh, and are linked very closely with Central Command on potential operations to close out the mission by the 31st. That was the direction given by the president, and we're committed to do that. And my commitment is to ensure that airlift is never the constraint to execute those operations. And we're, we're well synced with, with, with uh, Cent Central Command, uh, have a great relationship, uh, great teamwork. And so I, I think we're, we, 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 are, we, are, we are pushing the limits uh, to do everything we can to get every single evacuee uh, out of Kabul. Do you foresee fewer flights in the, say, the 28th, 29th, 30, 31st of the month as there are fewer ground forces, presumably, in Kabul? Well, I, I prefer not to get into numbers of flights by day. I, I would not uh, say that uh, we're going to let up. We're, we're not going to let up, uh, a, a, you know, full accelerator. Uh, we're, we're not going to let up. As long as there's a mission to be accomplished, uh, we'll be out there. I forgot to ask you to introduce yourselves because the general can't see you. So, uh, Courtney. Um, hey, General Lyons. This is Courtney QB calling. I'm uh, calling. This is Courtney QB from NBC News. Uh, you said that you're pushing the limits. Um, can you just explain a little bit more what you mean by that when you say you're pushing the limits to get as many people out? And then are you able to kind of give us like a big picture look at how many um, C-17s and C-130s out of the total Air Force fleet are dedicated to this mission right now out of the to entire U.S. military fleet? Well, it's a, you know, it's a, all mobility resources are focused on this on this effort. Um, there's a number of ways I could cut the numbers that might not be helpful to you, to be honest. Um, you know, right now, the air component has uh, uh, well over 200 aircraft uh, committed to operations. Some, some of these are, uh, even KC-10s are committed to the operation in some way or some uh, fashion. So uh, when, I say, when I say we're all in, uh, I mean to, to present, to uh, meet the President and the Secretary's directive to ensure that every evacuee that is cleared and uh, cleared to move can move. And, uh, and, and our crews are absolutely incredible. I, I won't lie to you, they're tired. Uh, they're probably exhausted in some cases. I know that the leaders from time to time are pulling uh, crews out to make sure we don't have safety issues, but they are motivated, they are fired up, and they are committed to complete this mission. One more about um, any COVID mitigation efforts that you're taking. Are you doing anything to ensure that your crews are, are, are safe from COVID? And can you give us a little bit of the detail of what that, that is, that looks like? Well, all the, it's, it's a great question. You know, we shouldn't forget that we're doing this operation in the middle of a pandemic. So all, all the crews are obviously masking, uh, and, and uh, but, but the Afghans that are that are you know on the aircraft uh, are not masked, so that's one mitigation. There is some uh, some screening that occurs uh, before they load, and then as we reach the temporary safe havens, these other uh, hubs and lily pads, uh, there are there are uh, uh, resources being applied to further test uh, the evacuees upon arrival to these various uh, temporary safe havens. All of your crews vaccinated, or are they getting tested at, at, at periodically to, to ensure that they're safe? The, the, you know, the vast majority are certainly tested. I, I can't say it conclusively that they all are. Uh, although, great news today from the from the FDA. So, pretty soon they'll all be uh, vaccinated. Jennifer. Jennifer Griffin from Fox News. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the constraints you faced and how you resolved them? And also, in the last 24 hours, you've gotten 18,000 or 11,000 passengers out of Kabul, clearing the backlog. Are you concerned that there are not enough people cleared through into the airport that you may have to take off with empty planes? Is there any sign that you're having to take off because of that quick turnaround with empty planes? Uh, great question. Uh, not not at this time, and uh, you know I'm in, we're in contact with CENCOM constantly. I talk to John McKenzie on a continuous basis, so we're synced up. Uh, and the idea is we'd never want to leave uh, Kabul Airport on an empty plane or even a partially full plane if we can avoid it. So we are we are not doing that. As a matter of fact, we're filling the aircraft uh, uh, to about 400 uh, 450 
uh, uh, passengers in, in a floor load uh, configuration. Uh, I just say to the to the to your first questions, it's an excellent question. You know, any any time that we move this fast in an operation, there's going to be fog and friction, and it's you know it, it's it's trying to achieve equilibrium in a very large uh, network of not just airplanes but ground operations and multiple uh, nodes throughout the network. And so there's a you know in, in initially it's it's moving quick. You're trying to grow capacity. You're you're moving as fast as you can. Sometimes you get a little ahead of yourself. And then it's trying to equalize out and uh, making sure you got a critical path open. Uh, but again, uh, right now, uh, we'll sacrifice the back end of the uh, of, all, of all the architecture and the nodes to make sure that we're clear in uh, Kabul International, and that's what we're doing now. I need to go to the phones. I haven't done that yet. Uh, Stephen Losey. Hi. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, so there are the reports about the uh, some of the threats that ISIS has made. And I know you're not speaking about specific threat um, environments, but can you talk to us a little bit more about how the military has communicated with the Taliban regarding these threats? Are you telling the Taliban it's their responsibility to keep ISIS away from the airport? And what happens if ISIS decides to embarrass the Taliban by launching terrorist attacks on the perimeter or the civilians trying to get into the airport? Stephen, I'll take that. That's that's more appropriate for me, I think, than for General Lyons. Um, as we've talked about uh, many times uh, over the last several days, we are in uh, daily communication with Taliban leaders outside the airport, sometimes multiple times a day, uh, to again uh, deconflict as best uh, as we can, and to uh, help ensure uh, a healthy access to the air airfield uh, for American citizens in particular. Uh, and that co that, that communication uh, continues uh, to to happen. We are also uh, mindful of the threat that ISIS poses, and without speaking for the Taliban, it's, I think it's a safe assumption to assume that that they too. Are are mindful uh, of that threat. Uh, I won't um, begin to uh, hypothesize uh, of what, what uh, could or could not happen, and I think you can understand that at the podium we wouldn't get into specific uh, intelligence streams or, or, uh, or what we're watching. Nobody wants to see um, anybody else hurt. And, and certainly nobody wants to see anything that could impact uh, our ability to continue to conduct this evacuation operation. All I would tell you is we're focused on this uh, every single day, hour by hour. We're monitoring the, the, uh, the threat environment very, very carefully. Um, and as I said, the communication with the Taliban continues. So, uh, Laura. Thank you, Thank you. This is Laura Seligman with Politico. First of all, can you tell us the total estimated cost of the evacuation? And then also, can you explain the discrepancy between the state and DOD numbers on the number of people evacuated? State is saying 25,000 since the operation began, but Major General Taylor earlier today, I believe he said 37,000. So what is that discrepancy? Uh, the, the numbers question. I mean, I, I, I can't sp speak for, I don't know, uh, I don't know where the, the other number came from, but um, but I think we're all in the interagency, we're all tracking these numbers, uh, the numbers that we put out this morning. You, I think you saw the, the, the White House actually put those numbers out uh, before we did. So uh, that 37,000 since uh, the 14th is, is what we're, we're counting on. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to the uh, general on your first question, uh, but it's whatever the costs are gonna be, Laura, are bigger than just the airlift. Um, and I can tell you that we don't have an estimate right now. Uh, our focus and uh, the focus of the entire interagency is to get as many people out as fast as we can and as safely as we can. Um, and we're not uh, let, letting uh, cost uh, drive the, the factor here, dr co cost drive uh, the operation. Uh, the operation is driving the operation and the need to do this uh, in a very urgent and orderly way. But I'll turn it over to the general if he has any more uh, data for you in terms of uh, the cost from his perspective. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't have said it any better than Mr. Kirby just said it. Uh, I, I mean, we're aware and we're tracking costs, but we're nowhere close to accumulating uh, that, that data for public dissemination. And I'm sure, Laura, that when, when all is said and done, I mean, uh, at the appropriate time, we'll certainly be able to provide an overall sense of what the, the, the cost is. I just would add that, that the, the real cost that we're focused on now is human life. That's the cost that we're focused on.
Therese. If I could just, if I could just follow up. Um, General Lyons, are you concerned about the Taliban's ultimatum that they issued if the U.S. has to stay past August 31st to complete the evacuation? And what is the plan to protect our forces and the evacuees in that case? Well, again, as I said, you know, we watch the, the, all, all risks and threats very closely. And, you know, I, I, I would defer to U.S. Central Command on most of the parts of those questions. We're in direct contact with them regularly, continuously. And then uh, we, you know, we have our own uh, processes and defensive measures and techniques, tech, tactics and procedures to, to take, uh, you know, to protect our crews and to protect our aircraft going in and out. We got time for two more. I'm going to go to Sylvie and then Therese. Go ahead, Sylvie. Um, hello, uh, General Sylvie Lantom from AFP. Uh, can you speak to us about uh, the cooperation with the Turkish forces at the airport? Uh, what kind of relationship do you have with them? Yeah, I, I, uh, I would defer to U.S. Central Command for that question. Um, I would not be able to characterize the relationship uh, on the ground. I know there is a relationship, but I would not be able to characterize that for you. Sylvie, remember the, the, the Turks are on the ground, really more of a security perspective. And so it, it is really more of a central command relationship that, uh, that, they're, that they're managing with the Turks every day. The Turks are still there. And of course, you know uh, at what scale that we're there. Therese? Uh, yes. Oh, thank you, John. I'm Therese Garnier with Newsy. Um, General Lyons, um, are medics being provided for each flight? I know there's a um, concern about capacity because you're trying to get as many people on. But are medics being provided? And the reason why I ask that is because there are reports that a woman had a baby during one of the flights. And so do you have medics that will be on board that will be able to handle any sort of emergency situations that may come up if someone has a baby or, you know, falls and gets sick or something in that instance? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we do not have medics on every flight. Uh, there is a medical screen uh, as part of the screening and boarding process. And uh, but I'll confess to you that many people would have to self-identify any kind of medical issue. Uh, re really exciting. I mean, I, I really appreciate the news reporting on the baby being born as that flight came into uh, Ramstein. Matter of fact, uh, there, there's actually been more than that. So it's just a just an incredible, incredible operation uh, ongoing. Uh, you know, just just impressive work by our great airmen. All right, so more than that. Yeah, what did you more mean by that? By that? I'm sorry. What did you mean by more than that? that? More than one baby? How many babies? <laughs> <laughs> so you're asking if there were more than one baby. <laughs> no, no other yeah, babies. Yeah, my, 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 well, my last data point was three. I, I don't have a formal tracker, but those are the, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. All right, sir. All right, we'll, we'll, follow, we'll follow up and try to get you information on the other two. Listen, we got to let the general, we, we have to let the general get. Uh, one last on the supplies, though, at, uh, at Ishkaya, um, General Lyons. Uh, we've, had, we've heard some concerns that there wasn't enough food or water for all the evacuees at the airport. Could you just talk about the efforts to fly in more sanitation, more MREs, more water for those that are trying to flee Kabul? Sure. Uh, well, you see all those aircraft going in there, and we never want to send an aircraft empty if we can't, so if we don't have to. So uh, CENTCOM is managing that. We've got plenty of capacity going in there, and there, and there is sustainment on those flights coming in that we're taking evacuees out. So, uh, they, you know, CENTCOM is addressing that issue. Thank you. Uh, General, we're going to let you go unless you have any closing thoughts, anything that you might want to just uh, hit at the end here. Well, John, I just, uh, again, thanks for being part of this today. But I, I you know, ag again, uh, how proud I am of our mobility airmen just operating around the globe. It's just impressive to see. And, uh, you know, e everybody is just in this all in, uh, rowing as hard as we can. And we're going to make this happen. I'm absolutely confident of that. Thank you, General. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you back here uh, mid-morning tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
We've been watching the Defense Department officials, the Pentagon briefing and the press on the situation in Afghanistan. Very different tone than a few days ago. They're talking about plenty of food and water coming in, babies being born. Uh, and that is definitely a change in tone. And it's because there's a change in the operation. One of the things sometimes it's hard for the media is to tell a story which takes a significant change. There's no question uh, that the collapse of Kabul and the need to evacuate Americans, tens of thousands of Afghan allies, took this administration by surprise. Uh, and the first few days, definitely very rough and dangerous. It remains rough and dangerous. But the pace of the operation has accelerated considerably. And you hear that in, in what we heard from Pentagon spokesman John Kirby uh, and General Stephen Lyons, who's the head of the U.S. Transportation Command, speaking there from Scott Air Force Base outside of St. Louis in southern Illinois. Uh, they are proud. They've got a different story to tell, and they want to they want to tell it. So let's bring in our senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, for more. Uh, Louis, am I wrong about that? Am I hearing uh, more optimism? Of course, there is this can-do spirit and commitment. At one point, uh, General Lyons saying that uh, that this is deeply personal to me. He said, I will not rest until we get all Americans who wish out together with as many Afghans as humanly possible. You're hearing that, but you're also hearing, I think, the, the, the sense that this mission at this point is going well. Well, Terry, we have to fit, remember who he is speaking about. He is in charge of all of the air crews, all of the aircraft that on very short notice in one week has ramped up to almost 37,000 evacuees over the last week or so. It's been a significant uplift in the last couple of days. Um, well, we're seeing now almost 20 to 30 planes flying daily uh, carrying out uh, evacuees. Those are just military planes. And in addition to that, there are additional commercial aircraft that are also bringing out people from the airport in Kabul. So um, I think, understandably, uh, General Lyons is very proud of the effort that has gone into this. Uh, he said we are pushing our limits, um, that his crews are exhausted. Um, and there's no doubt about that, because this has been a tremendous uh, effort that has launched incredibly in one week. Um, and so far, we saw those numbers varying uh, very low at the start of the week. And then now, uh, in the last 24 hours, we hear that there are 16,000 people that have left the airport in Kabul. But again, you have to look at the other side. You saw one of the last questions asked there was about the humanitarian situation inside the airport. Maybe there's not enough water. Maybe there's not enough food, um, other supplies. And yes, we have heard in stories like that. And we and when I asked uh, John Kirby earlier today about that, he said, we are concerned. That is something that we pay attention to. But at the same time, they said that, and you heard it from General Lyons here, they are all those aircraft that are flying people out on their way in, they're bringing in supplies uh, to, for those evacuees. The question is, is it enough, given that this operation is ramping up? And there were, as we heard from the White House, and you're hearing again today, August 31st, 31st seems to be the deadline. You know, Louis, we're, we're listening to these various briefings, and you were in the one uh, earlier today uh, as well, just talking about this mission, and they're st sticking to the August 31st deadline, and that things are uh, on point, and they're mission-focused. But we also can't forget the fact they are also trying to negotiate with the Taliban. <laughs> I mean, this is the Taliban that made a decision to embrace al-Qaeda. We saw 9-11, and we saw that outcome there. Now, fast forward, we can only hope and pray that the Taliban will decide not to embrace uh, the jihadists and move differently as they are negotiating, negotiating with the U.S., uh, because it didn't work out so well for them last time. No, you're right, and you've heard it from uh, Jake Sullivan at the earlier briefing at the White House. He was asked, do you trust the Taliban? And he said, of course not. Uh, he said the same, President Biden believes the same thing. But you have to be practical. You ha they are now in charge of the security in Kabul. They are in charge. They have taken over Afghanistan, um, except for maybe some pockets of small resistance that we're now hearing about. But either way, you're going to have to deal with them. And there's that situation that you heard uh, John Kirby talk about, the expansion of a, a little bit of a perimeter outside of the airport itself, the same with the Taliban doing the same thing. But that was all worked out. That's because they're talking to each other multiple times a day at the, at the general, the American general who's in charge of the operation there at the airport. He's in touch with the senior Taliban commander. And even at lower levels, thing, contacts are occurring. That's something that could not have been imagined just a week ago. Just think about what has happened in a week ago. We've seen the collapse of Kabul. We've seen the crush of humanity at the airport. We've seen the desperation of all of these people trying to get out. And we've seen the, the ex extremely large number of American resources, flights, and 6,000 troops that have 
converged on this airport to get out all of these people. We're talking about 37,000 people so far. But time is of the essence here because this deadline of August 31st um, is going to hang over. And that's why you're seeing and hearing a lot of questions today about whether it's going to be extended. The White House yesterday, when the president made his remarks, he kind of left the door open. That might be a possibility. Today, that's not the case. And we have to wonder why, whether that's driven by security issues. You talked about terrorism. I think the terrorist issue that they are concerned about at the White House and here at the Pentagon is a group called ISIS Khorasan, ISIS K for short. This is an ISIS affiliate that sprang out after the victories in Iraq and Syria from that group. They have been uh, very dangerous in targeting uh, civilians all over Afghanistan, particularly in Kabul over the last five years. I think that both the Taliban and the U.S. are concerned. They have a mutual interest here to defend the security at the airport because they don't want to see an ISIS attack there. Very interesting situation. Um, but the, the, the shift uh, for now is getting people out, and the Taliban seems to be on board. But you have to take it with a grain of salt. More question. We're looking at Kabul, at what's happening in Kabul for obvious reasons. But you know, as you know, as anybody who's been to Afghanistan knows, it's a big country. And having been around it a little bit over the years, there were Afghans that helped, that were our allies that helped American forces. There were Afghans that assisted the United Nations in women's clinics and elsewhere that are in, who are in danger right now. Do you have any sense uh, of if there are any plans or, or if there are any operations considered? Uh, how, how would you possibly reach people in Paktika and Helmand and Kandahar province? Is there, is there any talk about that? You're right, Terry. Afghanistan is a large country. When you look at it on the map, the map doesn't do it justice. It's a very large country. And when it's not as well connected by modern roads, when it's not connected by modern air travel, getting around the country can be extremely difficult. And you're right. There are a lot of people who helped the United States and the other Western allies during their 20-year mission there in Afghanistan. And it's hard to comprehend how they're making their way to Kabul if they can. But at the same time, we're hearing stories um, from some news outlets, some other organizations uh, that have contacts with uh, in the uh, hinterlands of Afghanistan. And they are talking, yes, people are being rounded up especially those individuals who worked with the Western powers. What happens to them? You heard Jake Sullivan. He was asked about the Americans in Kabul. Are you talking about Americans all over Afghanistan and getting them out? And he said yes. But I don't know if that also carries over to uh, the individuals who are out uh, outside of the capital city. Uh, Jake Sullivan did say at the White House um, that there is the possibility of the U.S. doing something after the military uh, airlift mission ends. Now, we're looking at August 31st for that. Something else could uh, appear beyond that. Uh, we heard that from State Department officials as well. It's unclear to me exactly what they mean. Maybe something will be negotiated with the Taliban so that these other individuals who do have the, the, the approved paperwork in hand but are not inside Kabul, maybe arrangements will be made for them that after this military airlift mission uh, is concluded, that they too can eventually leave Afghanistan. Louis Martinez at the Pentagon Force, thanks so much. And this does it for the breakdown today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kira Phillips in for Diane Macedo today. And I'm Terry Moran. We'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And make sure to tune into ABC News Prime tonight. Lindsay Davis will interview CDC Director Rochelle Walensky on today's FDA authorization of the Pfizer vaccine. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern. So until then, have a great day. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.